Good morning, folks. This is Brother Chad Long from Delhi Baptist Church with you again in Hebrews chapter 10. And when we left off talking about the assembling of ourselves together and how we ought to do it more, not less, the verse itself in Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And, and it just real simply means <clears throat> to do these things more. And the, the previous verse to it said to consider one another and provoke unto love and to good works, <coughs> which is one of the byproducts of assembling together. You'll encourage one another, if you do it right, you'll encourage one another to do more for God, to do more good works and for um, promoting love and growing. And <coughs> I, I can tell you that as you spend time with people, you truly begin to love them. A lot of people think they love um, when they first meet. Uh, it's because we don't fully understand love that that takes place. <clears throat> you say you love their children, you, you love your children when they're born, but you don't even know them yet. You have a duty to them, and, and, and you do care for them, but the love is grown over time. When you meet somebody and you want to date them, get to know them, you think you love them pretty early on. But most of the time, it's not love that you're feeling. Um, love is grown. It, you can have it early on, but it's grown as you get to know somebody better. You, the better you get to know somebody, the more you can truly love them, and that love will grow. I've seen this with people that <clears throat> I may not have cared for early on, but it just grew a deep love for them as I got to know them begin to understand who they were as a person. And the church will do that too. You've got to assemble together. You think you love somebody in your church now, but you'll love them so much more when you get to know them better. So anyway, to uh, provoke unto love and good works and to assemble is one side of this coin. And then verse 26 moves us in a uh, kind of an opposite direction for a minute just to clarify some things. Let me show it to you. He starts out with the word for, which is an odd word to start out with in English, but not in Greek. And it kind of sets the stage for what he's saying. <clears throat> for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Now, very clearly what he's saying is, there's only the one sacrifice. So if you continue on looking for any other way, after you've been made aware that there's only one sacrifice, well then, there's nothing else for you to hope for. Now, in their case, with the reason this was written is because they were continuing to offer sacrifices at the temple. They were continuing to go to the temple and uh, put up pretenses and appearances. Maybe some of them did that because they were worried about being persecuted as Christians. Maybe some of them really thought there was something to that old system. But the point is, what uh, Paul is telling them is that if you continue to sin like that, willfully like that, after you've been made aware that there's only one sacrifice and that sacrifice is Jesus, <clears throat> well then there's nothing more to hope in. Um, verse 27 says, But a fearful a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. It's not saying it will devour you. If, if you've accepted Christ, you've accepted Christ. You don't lose that. But I would have a hard time believing that someone who had accepted the sacrifice of the blood of Christ <coughs> and continues to seek after another sacrifice, I have a hard time believing that person's saved. They either are and they're ignorant. They don't understand that his blood is sufficient to do all, all that is needed. They either, they, they either are saved and they're just ignorant or they're not saved. They're just uh, putting up appearances. And I don't know. This is not talking about losing your salvation. This is talking about the fact that whether you continue the sacrificial system or not, there will be no other sacrifice for sin. There is no other sacrifice. That's all that's saying. He said, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There is no other sacrifice going to be made than that which is made. And you have to accept the one that was made 
or there's no other hope for you. There's nothing else to look forward to except a certain fearful judgment, uh, which will devour the adversaries, meaning those who are against Christ, those who have not accepted him, um, Satan and his minions, and then anybody who's rejected Christ. That's who has to worry about that. <clears throat> Verse 29, Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath, and, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. The only unpardonable sin, the only sin God cannot and will not forgive you for is blaspheming the Holy Ghost, which is just exactly what you're doing when you smear the name of Jesus and you stomp underfoot the sacrifice that he made. You have two choices when it comes to the sacrifice Christ made for you. You can accept it or you can reject it. But if you accept it, accept it wholly, entirely, fully. If you reject it, understand that by rejecting it, you may not be offered that again. And you may. Some people, I don't know. But some people are slow to come to, to accept the truth. I don't know that they fully reject it. They just struggle to accept it. But once you've rejected it, it's one thing to say, no, thank you, I'm not interested. Another thing entirely to stomp it underfoot. To and, and some people do. Some people go out of their way to attack, to ridicule, to mock or mimic those who love the Lord. And that's a, I don't think there's any coming back from that. Once you have that much hate in your heart for God, where you not only reject the sacrifice, but then uh, stomp it underfoot. Well, then ask the question, verse 29 asks, of how much more sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now when it says, I've counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified, it's just talking about the offer for sanctification. Obviously, a person is not sanctified if they're doing these things. <coughs> but it was offered. It was there. The blood is, is, is it's available. And so, I can't imagine a more sore punishment that they're worthy of. But I can tell you, God's not going to overlook that. So, again, he's talking to the Jews here who can't seem to make up their mind if they want to trust Christ if they want to go back to the sacrificial system. And he's letting them know that if you go do that, there's no hope in it. The only thing you can hope for is judgment because that's what's coming to those who, who have denied Christ. <clears throat> and especially a sore punishment, which is due to those who go beyond rejection and go out into well these wicked things that they're doing this uh, mocking and, and making fun of I often think of Bill Maher and it's okay if he hears his message he needs to anyway I think of Bill Maher it's not enough that he doesn't accept faith in Christianity or, or faith in Christ I mean I don't care what people think he is entitled to his opinion but it wasn't enough for him just to say, look, I don't subscribe to that. I don't agree with it. I'm not interested in it. Not enough to do that. But Bill Maher has gone out of his way to mock Christianity when he had a, oh, what's her name? Ann Coulter on his show. And he, 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 he looked over her at her with a smirk on his face, this smug expression. And he says, uh, what about your imaginary friend, Jesus Christ? which was just a rude and ugly thing to say to a woman he knew had faith in Christ. He called her, I'm, I'm, yeah, he, he, called, he, he called Jesus her imaginary friend. <clears throat> in addition, he's made a movie making fun of Christianity, a, a documentary, it's not really a movie. And I've not seen it, I've seen excerpts of it. And it's, it's as though he went out looking for the lunatic fringe and trying to paint everybody who believes in Jesus as one of those. 
Well, I can tell you that of how much sore punishment do you suppose he'll be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God? He's counted the blood of the covenant an unholy thing and I've done despite under the Spirit of grace. Um, I can't imagine much more gruesome punishment than the one he will receive. And it doesn't give me any joy to say that. I, I'm, I don't wish that on anybody. Not even him. But it is what it is. Verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. Now, this quote is found in multiple places throughout the Bible. It's in Deuteronomy, it's in Romans. And the quote is this, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And what Paul here is saying is, we know him that said that. We know God. We, those of us who truly trust in him, who truly accept Christ, we know him. And we know that he is going to take care of these things. It's not my job to hurt Bill Maher or anybody like him. For those who don't know, Bill Maher has a special on HBO, and uh, I don't watch it, but I've seen I've seen a couple of his interviews from time to time. I, I'll stumble on an excerpt from something he did, but I don't I don't take the time to watch him. But I know that every time Christianity comes up, he's attacking it, and he, he makes a pretty good sport of it. <clears throat> and we know that it's not our job as Christians. We're supposed to love him whether we like him or not. And I'll tell you right now. It's difficult to love a guy who's that ugly. But it's not my job to straighten him out or hurt him or to wish him evil. Um, the Bible says, Vengeance belongs to me, and I will take care of these things. Verse 31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I'm going to stop there and just say, not aimed at him at all. It's aimed at anybody who has rejected Christ it is a fearful thing you're headed for and I don't want you to head towards it I want people to accept the gospel I want people to hear the good news that he, he offered you um, redemption salvation he offered you a way to know him and to spend eternity with him what you do with that is up to you you, you have that option but if you don't like it don't attack others who do if you don't believe it, don't attack others who do. There's no reason for people to be that way. Um, I, I, I don't care what form hate takes. Hate is always wrong. The only hate I can justify or endorse is hating evil. And I mean evil, not people, but evil. Hating evil. And I do. I hate evil. I don't hate any person, but I hate evil. And... and Anyway, <coughs> I think the, the best way to leave this passage is just remember that there's no way but Christ. And if you're looking anywhere else, there won't be any other redemption for sin. So I pray that everybody will accept what he did. And I pray that those who don't accept it will leave those alone who do. And people just try to be civil and love one another. Christians need to love one another. Non-Christians can't fully love what they don't understand. But they can be nice. I pray you guys have a good day. Pray for me as I pray for you. God bless you.